Hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to West Coast uh, Meetup Machine Learning Meetup Group. Uh, last week we started discussing the score-based generative models. We went through one of the videos uh, that did the introduction to the topic. Uh, this week we will actually look into the details of uh, the score-based generative models from the person who is mostly responsible for. Uh, its invention or discovery and popularity. And uh, that, that person is Yang Song. Uh, he finished his PhD from Stanford, I think last year, and is at OpenAI currently. Uh, his work is the uh, foundation for DALI, Imagine, uh, and Stable Diffusions, uh, 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 Mid Denoising Algorithm, Mid Journey, of course, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, so all those all those uh, models and the what he did was uh, of course you know the original diffusion model was also based on Langevin dynamics uh, uh, from physics borrowed from physics but what he uh, did was to bring in the score uh, models score matching and score uh, uh, functions calculation through a network that helped accelerate our popularized the diffusion models. So diffusion models were uh, first invented back in 2015, but never took off till uh, Yang Song's work uh, made it made it more commonplace, if you may. So that's the uh, that's the core discussion we'll have today. Uh, this is a group discussion, as Sally and others would uh, mention many times, uh, have or have mentioned also many times. So if I am saying something that doesn't make sense, please interrupt and correct me. Or if you have thoughts or questions, just interrupt and we uh, we stop and uh, you know we, we do, do the discussion. Uh, it's also a little bit of a, uh, as, as people who have been part of it, a little bit more open and free meetup in the sense that we start a topic and if we think that we cannot finish it in this week, we'll continue next week till people feel comfortable with moving on to the next topic. And this is one of the big topics that we started last week. And in all likelihood, uh, it appears that will go on till next week, uh, including today week. So this week, it will be three weeks in all. With that, let me share my screen and share the Dev, agenda. Uh, Dev, let, yes, me yes. let me interrupt. If you have missed one of our previous meetings and want to catch up, we do have a YouTube channel called West Coast ML. So just go up there. And I try to, I try to get them up within... A week or so after that we have the meeting so just you know if you miss them just feel you can always pick it up there anyway i'll shut up now thank you jerry yes and the last week's uh presentation uh, it was more of a leading the video run of uh, another presenter to kind of get introduced to this topic uh and then we had some questions and answers so it's also up there but if you start from today we will catch up to what we did last week and given that this is a complex topic it doesn't hurt to repeat what we did last week in, a, in another video so with that let me share the screen okay uh so today we'll be discussing score based generative models and very quickly. This is the agenda of what we want to discuss. Uh, we will, uh, last week we did look into what score-based uh, models can achieve, but we did not go into the details of what score function, uh, oops, sorry, it actually is. So this week we will go into the details of score function that will probably be around 20, 25 minutes. And then we will go into the Yang Song's uh, video which goes into the score model, in particular, a model that calculates the score function uh, using score matching between the network and the, uh, the data distribution score. So once we understand what score is, we will get into what uh, this model is doing. Uh, and then he will talk about how that, uh, there are different mechanisms of doing that. But more importantly, after introducing score function in the score model, he'll go into why that is useful for the noise conditions for network, which is where we get much of the uh, the benefits of using the score model. Uh, we'll 
probably be able to do till here today. Uh, if we are able to go further, sure, we will continue. But my guess is that we will probably go till here. And then next week uh, or whenever we will continue doing uh, the Langevin dynamic sampling, which is uh, uh, improved sampling based on the score function. Uh, and then using the score in the stochastic differential equation-based uh, model for denoising for image generation, uh, mapping the SDE to ODE for optimization so that we have less number of, uh, of samplings to be performed or optimized samplings, and then more examples and applications. So rest of this, uh, as you can see, this is a huge topic and a huge uh, uh, area to cover. Uh, and as I've said before, it's more than the PhD uh, for Yang Song. So we'll try to cover that in two weeks. So with that, let me switch to uh, let me switch to the video, and then we'll go from there. Uh, sometimes the video may give me difficulty, as you can see, it's still spinning, but hopefully it will go through. Are pe people able to hear it fine, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, hear the audio. I'm waiting to see if the video is clear or not. Yes, sorry. Uh, this is a uh, probabilistic image. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, is, it will clear up uh, once I continue. And uh, so we got the best quality and uh, full screen. Welcome to Mutual Information. My name is DJ. In this video, we're going to learn about the Fisher information. This thing is an absolutely foundational idea which quantifies the amount of information an observation carries about a parameter. More generally, it provides a general framework for reasoning about parameter uncertainty. It is a frequentist concept, which is kind of a dirty term these days, but it has grown beyond that world. Bayesians and machine learning practitioners love to borrow it for new ideas. Is, is this the video to that name you a few, it's to used do? in the Jeffries prior, natural gradient methods, experimental design, and probably others that I just haven't heard of. So to empower you with this idea. Is this the video that you wanted to be doing? You're muted, Dave. Okay, sorry about that. So yes, this is the video that I want to go through. So even though he's talking about score function, oh, sorry, Fisher information, Fisher information or Fisher, Fisher matrix is nothing but the uh, uh, derivative of the scores uh, or, or the, the, the covariance of the score for a model with multiple parameters, uh, a, a probability distribution model with multiple parameters. Uh, he he will talk about that score function is nothing but the Fisher score. Uh, the, uh, the score value is nothing but the Fisher value, Fisher information. Uh, however, uh, he goes into the motivation and explaining what that is, uh, which is then makes it easier for us to understand why this whole score the, the the next video is all about score calculation. So without this motivation, it becomes a little bit, okay, let's just assume there's, some, there's something called score and let's do it, but why and where it is important. Uh, this video, which is around 15 minutes, but maybe with pauses like this, maybe around 20, 25 minutes, we'll, we'll finish it. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. I just was confused. I thought you said we were go first going to see the Yang song. So sorry for the oh. interruption. Uh, no, no. First, we'll look at the Fisher information, which is the score function, uh, which is this video. And then we'll continue with the Yang Song's video. Idea. My approach will be to explain the goal of the Fisher information and then show how it's a clever way to achieve that goal. Now, for the sake of a gradual explanation, I'm going to start in a simple one-dimensional case and then generalize to higher dimensions. The higher dimensional case is really what you want for applications. That's where all the cool stuff happens. That said, let's jump in. First, let's say a random variable y is related to a parameter, which is just a single number here, by some known probability density function. We write that generally with this expression, which is here to represent any function that accepts both an observation of y and a parameter value, and then gives us a number, which tells us the likelihood of that observation according to that parameter. Now, here's the question. According to whatever this thing is, 
How well does an observation of y locate the parameter value that produced it? In fact, the goal is to measure how well an observation locates that parameter. Now, if you're like me, the vagueness of this goal makes it hard to imagine what a solution would even look like. But what does help me is to consider cases at two extremes. For the first case, let's use the normal distribution with a large variance. What I mean by that is p of y given theta is the normal density function where our theta is the mean of the normal and we assume we know the variance, which we'll set to a relatively high value of 25. For the other case, we'll consider the exact same thing except with a small variance of 1. Very, very frequently, when we want to go from observations to parameter estimates, we consider the log likelihood function. To show that, I'm going to simulate data according to the large variance case first. And then, for each observation, draw the log likelihood function. Each one of these lines tells us how likely one of our observations is as we vary our mean parameter along the horizontal axis. Keep in mind, the data is generated according to some parameter value which I haven't told you. We'll call that value the true parameter value. Naturally, let's consider the small variance case as well. Okay, now, take a step back and look at these two cases. I have not told you the true parameter value, but you tell me, in which case would you have an easier time guessing that parameter value? Isn't it obvious? It's clearly the right side, the small variance case. Effectively, each line shows one observation's vote of where the true parameter is. In this case, all observations overlap on a narrow range, making it easier to pinpoint that value. As you may be able to guess, that true parameter value is 5. Going forward, we'll refer to that true value as mu star. And so, we might say that in the small variance case, our observations provide more information about where mu star is. In fact, I should emphasize, when we say information, it's this narrowness that we're after. Honestly, this view is all you need to understand the goal of the Fisher information. But now, separately, the question becomes, how does the Fisher information turn this narrowness into a number? How do we measure that information? For that, we'll need a new view. First, let's redraw what we just saw. Here, we're showing the small variance case. Next, let's pick a parameter value, totally arbitrarily, to plug into these functions. I'll call this evaluation point mu naught. If we plug mu naught in, we'll get back a big list of numbers. Over here, we'll see an estimated distribution of those numbers. Finally, we're in a position to see the key idea of the Fisher information. The idea is to consider the slopes of these functions at our evaluation point. If we recall a smidge of calculus, we know the functions that generate these slopes are the derivatives, which we can draw as well. In general, the derivative of a log likelihood with respect to the parameters has a special name. We call them score functions. As you can see, in this case, the score functions happen to be linear. As we'll see, all the action hangs out in the distribution of scores at our evaluation point. So, just like we did below, let's show that distribution along with the mean line of that distribution. To get a feel, let's move around the evaluation point a bit. The first thing I bet you'll notice is the shape of the slopes distribution stays the same. Well, please ignore that observation. That comes from the fact that the normal distribution has linear score functions, and that's not true in other non-normal cases. But there is one thing that generalizes to all other cases. When we evaluate these score functions at the true parameter value, the mean of the scores is zero. To provide some real simple intuition, the average score is zero at the true point because it has to be. If it wasn't, the data would be suggesting a more likely parameter value is somewhere else. But in this setup, that can't be. The most likely parameter value must be our true parameter value because it generated our data. I wanted to pause here because we did go through a lot of information so far. Um, and, and just to kind of highlight, uh, this is the plot for the log probability for each of the data points. So assuming that mu is the parameter we are estimating for, for this distribution and we are given different yi's, for each of the yi's, uh, if we have, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the likelihood that we will have for that data point will be highest if our probability distribution, uh, or in this case, the log P, of course, 
uh, has a curve corresponding to like this. So for example, if we have a point over here where I'm pointing right now, the curve that will correspond for the maximum likelihood for that one will correspond to this and so on and so forth. So since we don't know what mu is, we just are drawing all these different log curves for each of the data points. I know there's a question of this kind, similar kind in uh, chat as well, Karthik. So are the different green curves obtained for different va values of uh, yi's? Uh, does, does that answer your question, Karthik? Uh, yeah, it does. Thanks, Dev. Yeah. Yes. So different x size will get this. And then if we if if we know the true mu, then at the true mu, the slopes will for different data points, uh, for the different uh log likelihood curves, uh in the Gaussian case will be uh the expected value will be zero. And that's what it is trying to show here. Uh the 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 slope of it, if you may is uh, the distribution of slope will be zero. And this is what uh, shows up here. And uh, the other thing is, uh, if you notice, initially assume that let's say if this was our parameter, and if that was our parameter mu, let's say 2.5 or whatever that number is, uh, four, then for that parameter, uh, the, the distribution will, be over here, which will have a, uh, the derivative log p uh, greater than zero somewhere over here, five or something. But if it is actually the true parameter value, mu that we are able to estimate uh, over there for a Gaussian distribution, the slopes uh, mean would be zero. And if you notice, this is a zero uh, over here, and this is what it will match with. And the slopes, uh, the distribution of the slopes at this point, or any point for that matter, is what is uh, 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 posted here. And this is what the actual uh, score uh, function is. Uh, but let's continue. He'll go into more motivations and details of why that is useful for the, the, for the actual generative modeling later on. Hey, Dave. Quick question before you start again. Um, oh, so he said that the the mean expected value of of our uh, score functions will be zero. That's in theory, uh, empirically, it should be close, but it won't be exactly zero, right? For Gaussian, it is zero, or for some functions like that, it is zero. No, but I'm saying yes, if you just yes. sample fifty points, they might just randomly not. Well, they, I think that's kind zero. of. The is essentially comparing the theoretical of the perfect curve from the samples. But, but yeah, I mean, I think Ted, you're right. Like the probability that it's actually zero is, um, well, it's not actually I just want to zero, make sure but it's, I understand. But it's really close to zero. You're yeah. right, Ted. What Telly is saying is right, uh, Ted, and what you're saying is right, because we yeah, don't okay. have the, uh, the actual parameters, right? We are trying to estimate from the data and we don't have the entire data, right? And, and so whatever data we have based on the analysis of the distribution there, uh, we will get a value which is somewhere in that area, but not exactly that because we don't have all the points. Is that what you're going to say, Sally? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Hopefully that answers it. I'll continue on if you have more yeah, questions. Yeah, thank you. And now we're just about ready to see the Fisher information, but I want you to guess what it is. To help, I'm going to move between our two cases. We're starting in the informative case with a small variance. Now let's increase it. Hmm. Getting any ideas? Anything jumping out? It seems to me in the informative case, there is a wider variance in the scores. In the uninformative case, there is a small variance, which means they are all hanging around zero. To gain some intuition, think about what a single small score value is telling you. If it's 0.001, that means that data point recommends shifting mu by 1,000 if you'd like to increase the log likelihood by one. If it's minus 0.001, it's saying you need to shift mu by 1,000 in the other direction. So a lot of score values huddled around zero collectively tell you to move nowhere 
but individually provide wildly different recommendations about where the true value lives. In other words, a small variance of the scores implies a large range of possible new values. This is the key idea behind the Fisher information. And finally, we can state its definition. The Fisher information is the variance of these score functions when we evaluate them at the true parameter value. In other words, it's a measure of the width of this distribution when it's centered on zero. To put it on the screen, I'll show two times the square of the Fisher information as this horizontal width. Now look, as we move between the uninformative and informative cases, the Fisher information follows naturally. And hopefully, you can feel mechanically what's going on. Remember, the goal of the Fisher information is to measure narrowness, and this does precisely that. As we become more narrow, the slopes vary more widely, and the Fisher information increases. But there's more, as you may have guessed from this big empty space. Let's once again consider the slopes at our evaluation point, but this time of the score functions. In fact, in the exact same way the middle row relates to the bottom row, let's create a top row which relates to the middle row. That means we'll plot the second derivatives and an estimated density of the second derivatives at the evaluation point. As you could tell, in this normal distribution case, the second derivative is constant. Okay, and now I can state this result. The Fisher information, which is the variance of the scores, is also, if it exists, equal to the negative expected value of the second derivatives. Now, the normal distribution isn't a great case to show that, since the second derivative is always one value. So let's transform it into a weirder case where that isn't true. And now we can see it. Now, you may reasonably ask, why is this true? Well, I will avoid the proof because I do not know it, but I can offer intuition. Basically, you expect a wide variance in your slopes if your slopes are changing a lot. Slopes that are changing a lot have extreme slopes themselves, meaning the average second derivative is extreme. So, it's not crazy to imagine the expected second derivative is the variance of the slopes. Now, that wordy explanation may not do it for you. In that case, just try to feel the mechanics between extremes. When the observations make it easy to locate a parameter, your slopes vary a lot. When they vary a lot, the average second derivative is extreme. Now, the view I've given so far is a bit too simple to be useful. I don't think anyone really cares about the one-dimensional case. So, let's generalize all the way to two dimensions. I'll do that by doing the exact same exercise, except we'll be using a 2D multivariate normal. The parameters in this case will be the... Uh, I think we should spend some time looking. Uh, it's only, I don't know, maybe five minutes or so uh, in the 2D case, because in general, you know, we will have multidimensional parameters for our uh, probability distribution uh, that we're trying to estimate. So this, even though, He'll not go into the fish, uh, fish information matrix uh, details. He'll stay at the score uh, function because that's what is easily viewable with two dimension. It gets harder and harder to uh, you know uh, to put all the information in graphical view in two D for people to see as you go high dimensions. So, but that will help us understand the score function in two dimensions, and then uh, as. Uh, uh, Professor Hinton would say that imagine 14 and fish uh, score function and fish information for our matrix for 14. But let's do two dimension and we'll go from there. The vector of two means, and we'll assume the covariance matrix is known, just like we assume the variance was known in the earlier case. Since two dimensions is a heavier lift visually, we can't show all six of these graphs. So we'll generalize only two of them. The first will be the one showing the log likelihood curves and their slopes. And the second will be the distribution of those slopes. Ready? All right, let's jump back into the black abyss. Now, let's think. In the 1D case, the x-axis was our one-dimensional parameter space. Now, we need to generalize that to a 2D parameter space. Okay, let's draw that with the true parameter point called out. The next thing we need to do is draw a 2D version of those log likelihood curves we saw earlier. Let's think. Those curves received a single parameter value as input and gave us back a log likelihood. Now they need to accept two parameter values. So we could think of the 2D version as domes that cover this 2D plane. And typically, such things are represented with contour lines like this. Next, we need a 2D version of a slope. Those told us how changing the parameter value at a point would change the log likelihood. The analogy in higher dimensions is the gradient vector. 
That's a line that looks like this. The gradient vector tells you the direction you should choose if you want to increase the function as much as possible. The length of the gradient tells you how much the function will increase if you take that step. Earlier, we didn't play with just one likelihood function, we played with many, one for each observation sampled using the true parameter. So to avoid a blizzard of contour lines, I'll represent one likelihood function with a single ellipse. And now we can represent many. So staring at the setup, can you guess what the 2D Fisher information will tell us? Seriously, pause the video and scratch your head on this one. It's worth thinking about. Just try to carry the analogy from 1D to 2D. Of course, in the video, he wouldn't pause, but I don't know if people wanted to pause and uh, no, but if not, I'll continue. That's a resounding no. I'm okay. No sound. <laughs> <laughs> Done? Okay, let's do it. In the 1D case, the Fisher information told us the variance of the log likelihood slopes. More generally, it's describing the distribution of those slopes. Now in this case, we need to describe the distribution of these gradient vectors. To do that, let's plot the 2D histogram of these vectors. If a square is bright, that means there are a lot of gradient vectors with the coordinates of that square. With that, I can say whatever the 2D Fisher information is, it's going to describe this histogram. Before I tell you it, I should point something out. On the left, the gradients randomly point out from the center. They don't agree on any one direction. In the 1D case, we saw this behavior as the slopes averaging out to zero. To refresh, this is because we are evaluating our gradients at the true parameter value from which all our observations are generated. If we were evaluating at a point that wasn't the true parameter vector, these gradients would favor one direction over the other and the Fisher information wouldn't apply. With that, let's think about what this Fisher information must do. We need to describe this 2D histogram centered at zero. In the 1D case, it was the variance. Some of you who know your stats may be able to guess it. It's the covariance matrix. It's a square grid of numbers that describes how elements of a vector sampled from a distribution vary together. So in this case, the higher dimensional Fisher information is the covariance matrix of the gradient vectors. I can just show you. The Fisher information tells us this ellipse. How it tells us that ellipse isn't important. Think of it as a compact summary of this histogram, and then let's just focus on that histogram. To get a feel, let's consider the simplest case, where the gradient elements aren't correlated. In this case, the variance of each gradient element is all there is to know. And we can interpret each of those in much the same way we did in the 1D case. If that gradient vector element varies a lot, we can nail down the parameter associated with it very well. Now, let's introduce some serious correlation. To intuit this, let's consider only parameter values that fall on this red strip. The question is, if you were only looking at parameter values here, could you easily determine which ones are likely to be near the truth? I mean, yeah, it looks like it would be easy. The observations only fall on a small piece of this diagonal line, and it's no accident. This is also a direction the histogram varies quite a bit. In other words, a direction in which the gradients vary widely is a direction where you can easily separate likely from unlikely true parameter values. And it's for exactly the same curvature reasons we saw in the 1D case. As you can guess, a direction like this is where we have difficulty determining the true parameter values. And this is a direction along which gradients don't vary much at all. This is the Fisher information. It's telling us how well observations will separate likely from unlikely true parameter values along any given direction, and it does that using the distribution of slopes at the true parameter values. But what about the second derivative stuff? Does that work here too? Yes, 100%. There's a higher dimensional analogy of the second derivative called the Hessian, and the expected negative Hessian turns out to be equal to our gradients covariance matrix. Though showing that would be tricky, but stating it, that's easy. In fact, we should restate everything with the glory math. After all, my goal is to help you apply this stuff. These visuals are nice and all, but to be useful, they need to connect to the papers and textbooks that handle this beast. Ready? Okay. The Fisher information is a measure of the amount of information an observation of a random variable carries about a parameter according to the probability function that relates them. It's defined with this expression, which I'll break down. First, we write it as a function of a true parameter value, which is theta star, to generalize it beyond a specific true parameter. 
Second, this means the variance of something that depends on y, where the random behavior of y is according to that theta star. Third, this means we'll be evaluating each score function at the true theta, giving us a bunch of numbers of which we are interested in their variance. And as we mentioned, the variance turns out to be equal to the negative expected value of the second derivative. These two expressions communicate everything we covered with those six panels we saw earlier. Sidebar, I just want to point out, this is why mathematical notation is so useful. With a very compact expression, we can communicate a big idea very precisely. Next, let's move on to the multidimensional case. I covered it in 2D, but just take it as given that those same ideas generalize to n dimensions. Ready? Okay. The higher dimensional form is called the Fisher information matrix, which generalizes the Fisher information to handle a vector of parameters rather than a single one. In this case, the matrix is a square grid of numbers where the ith row and jth com are given by this expression. If this expression looks unfamiliar, that's because this is a different way to write covariance. Since the expected partial derivative with respect to any parameter is zero, we can write their covariance as this expected product. It just follows from the definition of covariance. If this algebra looks like a lot, that's fine. It's not important to internalize it. What is important is to know the overall statement, which I'm about to say. The Fisher information matrix is the covariance matrix of the log likelihood gradient with respect to the parameters when we evaluate that gradient at the true parameter vector and the randomness comes from that true parameter vector. Whew, that's a lot. Okay, let's also say that last part regarding the Hessian. That is, an element of the Fisher information matrix also turns out to be equal to the negative expected value of the second partial derivative for the two parameters associated with that element. If that's also hard to digest, just think in terms of that 1D graphic and trust that it works in higher dimensions. And that's all of it. If you have any questions, please comment. And yeah, if you're talking, uh, we're not hearing. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Uh... Uh, I was talking. <laughs> Let me repeat that. So this is in essence what uh, we will see in Yang Song's video as well, where he is trying to estimate the score function. And this is the score function that you see in the middle here. And then we'll take the derivative of that to find where we can uh, try to match it to the actual probability distributions. Uh, get, an, get an estimate to the score function and then subsequently apply it to the uh, image generation. Uh, uh, and how and why noise conditioning is important. But anyway, so that's what he'll do. I hope this was helpful. Uh, if anyone has any comments or thoughts on this before I... While I switch, uh, feel free to please share that. So this is a talk given by uh, Yang Song at uh, uh, this forum called MIT CBMM. I think uh, this is the Brain Minds Plus Machines Center at MIT. Uh, and uh, I have found this uh, uh, this uh, channel to be really helpful to find one or once in a while some really cool uh, uh, videos uh, that go into the details like this one will go uh, as well. So I will in this one, maybe not to full screen because his screen will always remain this much. And instead I will just do the manual zoom in uh, of, of the screen. So it is better to see. Uh, with that, in the beginning, of course, you'll have some generic talk for maybe around three, four minutes. Uh, please don't mind that. Uh, he'll go into the actual details at around three and a half minutes. So since there are no more questions, I'll move to this video and we'll keep pausing. And again, you know, please feel free to interrupt if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, or anything you want to share.
and if I said anything wrong in the Zoom chat, uh, please feel free to correct either uh, Zoom or, uh, or chat. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, to give us a tutorial. There's been a lot of uh, interest uh, in our department and of course elsewhere. Um, and Dr. Yang Song is currently at OpenAI and joining um, Caltech in 24, you said, as an assistant professor. Um, so we are very excited to hear about diffusion and score-based generative models. So please take it away. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. So I will be giving you a tutorial on diffusion models. Uh, this tutorial is a little bit different because I will approach diffusion from the perspective of a score matching and score-based generative models. So in this talk, you can view score-based generative models as an interchangeable term with diffusion models. So I'm using score-based generative models because I hope to emphasize the connection of them to score functions. So score functions, are defined as gradients of log probability densities. By modeling and estimating this quantity, we can build very flexible and powerful probabilistic genetic models that can give us uh, very high quality samples and also predict accurate probability values. So uh, in this talk, I will mostly cover the research I did during my PhD at Stanford. And uh, this line of research is impossible without the help of many collaborators, mentors, and friends whose names are listed below. So uh, let's start by briefly reviewing the recent progress of deep genetic models in various applications. So nowadays, we are able to build very powerful image genetic models that can create realistic pictures from text description. So here is an example provided by DALI2, which is a model developed by OpenAI. And you can find similar pictures generated from uh, imaging or stable diffusion. And similar success has been extended to video generation as well. And this is an example uh, generated from imaging video, which is a model developed by Google Brain very recently. And deep genetic models are also very useful for many scientific applications. This, this video shows you an example of using deep genetic models to predict the radar maps for weather outcasting. And DeepMind has demonstrated that this approach can even outperform human experts on weather outcasting. We can also use deep genetic models to help us automatically complete code in order to maximize the productivity of computer programmers. And this is an example uh, of using a language model for generating uh, the code given comments of the computer program. So this technology has already been deployed to products uh, and you might have known it as GitHub Copilot. So, we have so many important applications of deep genetic models. And you may ask, how can we build such powerful genetic models? So it turns out that almost all genetic models, they follow the same pipeline. And the basic idea is to estimate the probability distribution of data. So in order to build a deep genetic model, the first thing we need to do is to collect a large data set. And as a running example, Let's suppose the data set contains many images of dogs. A typical assumption in statistics and machine learning is that all those data points in our training data set came from some underlying data distribution. In other words, those data points are basically ID samples from this data distribution, but we don't have the analytical form of the data distribution and we have to estimate it. And to estimate this data distribution, we have to create a model. This model represents a parametrized probability distribution, which we call the model distribution. And we hope to tune this model parameter to make sure this model distribution is close to the data distribution in certain sense. So if this model distribution is very close to the data distribution, then we can use the model for many important applications. And one example is, of course, we can generate an unlimited number of novel data points just by sampling from this model distribution. 
Another application is we can use this model distribution to compute the probability value for any potential data point. So as an example for a data point, like a picture of a chihuahua, because it is a picture of a dog, it is actually within our data distribution. And therefore, this model distribution usually assigns high probability values for such data points. For some irrelevant data point, like a picture <laughs> of a muffin, because it is not a picture of a dog, a good model distribution will assign lower probability values to such images. So because this model distribution provides a way to generate novel data points, we also refer to it as a genetic model. So how can we train those genetic models? As we know, we have a large data set, we may formalize the problem a little bit further. So we can use symbols like XI to represent each data point in the data set. And we have a total of N data points. And our model provides a family of probability distributions. And we hope to find a single probability distribution inside this huge family by minimizing the distance from P data to P theta. And afterwards, we can just generate samples from P theta. However, there is one key challenge associated with this framework. That is our data distribution can be extremely complicated, especially for data with high dimensions. So consider how complicated it might be for distributions of images, video, audio. It might have millions of dimensions. And as a result, we have to build a very powerful model distribution in order to estimate our data distribution. So how can we build a powerful model distribution? Let's recall that in statistics, we often work with simple distributions, such as a Gaussian distribution. Of course, a Gaussian distribution is too, too simple. It won't be able to approximate our complicated data distribution, but it serves as a good starting point. So uh, a Gaussian distribution is basically a computational graph that has two layers. The first layer corresponds to the input data point. The second layer is a single unit that basically gives you the probability density function of this Gaussian distribution. So this computation is very simple. And the mu in this slide denotes the mean parameter of this Gaussian distribution. By changing the parameter mu, you are basically changing the mean of this Gaussian. But as we said, Gaussian models are too simple. How can we make a more complicated model? Well, one very natural idea is to leverage a bigger and deeper computational graph. And we also call it a deep neural network. So we hope to use a deep neural network to represent a complicated probability distribution, P theta, where theta denotes the weights in this deep neural network. Mm -hmm. And when we use deep neural networks to build those powerful genetic models, we obtain deep genetic models. But it is actually non trivial to use a deep neural network to directly represent a probability distribution, because we typically view a deep neural network as a black box that converts a high dimensional input X to a typically one dimensional output F data. So this output value at data does not directly model distribution because it may not be positive everywhere. So one first step to convert this into a probability density is to take the exponential of the output so that the output becomes positive. And then we can normalize the output by dividing by a constant z theta in order to construct a probability distribution which has positive values everywhere and is also properly normalized. So the denominator here is called the normalizing constant. And by definition, this normalizing constant should be computed by evaluating the high dimensional integral of the exponential function of f theta over all possible values of x in the space. In the special case of Gaussian models, this normalizing constant is very simple to compute because f theta in Gaussian models has a very simple form, so we can directly compute the integral in closed form. 
But when we are trying to handle more powerful deep neural network models, this normalizing constant becomes intractable to compute. And as a quick example, even if we consider a simplified case where x is discrete, and in which case the integral becomes a summation, computing this normalizing constant is still a sharply complete problem, which is at least as hard as NP complete. I just wanted to pause here if people had any questions so far. Uh, and it's, it's kind of uh, sharing how it is modeled, uh, but what are the challenges with this model and uh, ultimately it depends on this integral to get the normalizing constant, to get the probabilities, to get the actual probability distribution and getting this normalizing constant for all the uh, possible values of input, in this case, X, is not going to be feasible. So calculating the integral is not feasible. And therefore, even though this approach seems like a reasonable approach, it has uh, bottlenecks or, or it has uh, roadblocks. It cannot, uh, it cannot be uh, implemented as is. Hey, does, hey, Dave. Yes. Just a quick comment, like, um, at the risk of stating the obvious, the the normalizing constant is is really important because, like, if you were just looking at a picture and you're like, "Well, I, I don't need to know the exact probability. I just want to know if it's kind of high or kind of low." Okay, and the neural network outputs a hundred. Well, like, without that normalizing constant, a hundred could be like one of the smallest possible values out there, and everything else is over a billion. <laughs> or 100 could be huge and all the other values are like, you know, less than one. So without that normal and constant, you really have no sense of scale. And that's why you really are up the creek if you don't know. Uh, what that but if we are is. interested in uh, just knowing if it is higher or lower, like comparing to images, then uh, normalizing constant is not important, I suppose. It's not as important, but again, yeah, like, can, yeah. so, so I'm a one and you're a 10. So you're definitely 10 times more likely than me, right. but are we both still like way extremely unlikely? And we're like, you know, all like he showed, you know, blueberry muffins or because you're 10, does that mean that you're kind of in the Chihuahua range? You know, you really can't I mean, he, know that. He did mention NP complete here. So I think that's probably part of the answer to their <clears throat> which is that in order to use the relative value between things, you have to do something like a grid search. And so to do grid search or, you know, any sort of like normalized Bayesian search over a million dimensions, <clears throat> I think you've gotten back into the land of NP complete anyway. So you, you do right. need the constant in order to be able to operate uh, numerically, not necessarily in a closed form, but to operate numerically versus relatively. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that people had an intuition that, like, you really can't, like, fake it without the normalizing constant. But there, are, that that being said, that there are places, which we're not going to talk about today, where people do use the relative of two things to give them a direction. But, like, but just to simply say, like, oh, this is a likely image or whatever, you really can't know unless you know the normalizing constant. Right, and hopefully we'll talk about that uh, today, Ted, uh, where focus on the uh, t the part where it says constant and where the score function, if you recall, derivative, and when you take a derivative of constant, it will be zero. And so something that you're maybe leading to, but uh, there will be some discussion of it today for sure, uh, where it cancels out in the formula, in the way the problem is formulated here. I'll continue here. Uh, hey, Dave, one question. Maybe if it's premature, I'll hold off. But uh, uh, what are the implications of uh, violating this uh, assumption of uh, data being uh, IID, say, for example, if uh, the data set consists of uh, augmented images that are just transformations of uh, certain other images? Uh, uh, would that have any uh, 
more serious implications uh, in case of uh, generative models than in say uh, discriminative uh, models like classifiers or it would be the impact would be lesser or uh, uh, will the talk touch upon those things so uh, we will touch upon the quality of data a little bit later on but as you can imagine you know the diversity of data will help you with uh, modeling your domain much better and that's where augmentation to help in modeling it better it's not always uh wash out if you but of course if you have only one image and you're trying to augment that in different mm -hmm. ways uh it's not helpful but mm -hmm. uh both the uh, i mean diffusion mm -hmm. models as such are data heavy and uh they require in order to be able to model your uh probability the data distribution space, they do expect you to be able to bring in a lot of data. So that's one. Uh, the second is that um, in terms of augmentations, that's also uh, important to understand the uh, distribution because you're talking about latent, which models your data uh, in, in uh, uh, you know, in in uh, in this case, in case of diffusion, of course, um, it is even if you don't go to latent, just that remaining the same dimension. It's a very huge dimension, so you need to be able to model uh, a huge uh, dimensional data, right? So, mm -hmm. if you do not, the augmentation will help you uh, bring out the nuances of your correlation, if you may, between the mm -hmm. probability distributions, right? So mm -hmm. if you till, war, uh, rotate, whatever else you do, uh, you're trying to get the correlation between different pixels uh, or, or uh, the dimensions in this case, right? Uh, whatever you end up being uh, modeling here. So uh, th that's a very generic answer. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so in general, uh, general, you are saying that it could uh, help similarly as it does in case of uh, uh, classifiers or uh, other types of discriminative models, but uh, uh, you still need to have fairly large uh, and diverse data of, uh, uh, in the even without these augmentation techniques in order to be able to uh, span the entire uh, 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 feature space better. Yes, absolutely. You definitely need a lot uh, of data here than just the uh augmentations got it thank you and this difficulty is by no means the unique challenge in deep genetic modeling you can find ma many similar challenges in adjacent fields such as thermodynamics and statistical mechanics and people have been studying this problem for quite a while in the current literature of deep genetic models there are mostly three approaches to address this intractable normalizing constant difficulty. And uh, uh, as a result, we can actually categorize deep genetic models into three different categories or families. So the first category is based on approximating this normalizing constant using approaches such as Markov chain Monte Carlo. So one typical example inside this family is energy-based models trained by contrastive divergence. So the disadvantage of this direction is that because we have to approximate this normalizing constant, we cannot compute the probability value accurately since the probability value requires dividing by this approximate normalizing constant. The second major approach is based on using restricted neural network models such that this normalizing constant is tractable by construction. So there are a few examples inside this family but the challenge is that once we restrict our neural network models, we also limit the flexibility of deep genetic models that we can potentially build along this direction. So the last category is based on modeling the data generating process directly instead of modeling the probability density function. So the most predominant example in this family is generative out of serial networks. However, because those approaches do not model the underlying data distribution, they cannot give us accurate probability values. So these are a few challenges associated with previous genetic modeling frameworks. And if we want to address those difficulties by proposing a better framework of genetic modeling, 
then we require this better framework to sanctify certain desiderata. And one thing is we hope this better framework can allow us to use very flexible neural network models uh, to parameterize this distribution. So this not only addresses the second challenge on the left side, but also allows us to take full advantage of the deep learning revolution to leverage very powerful deep neural networks to build our uh, to build our deep genetic models. The second distortion is we hope to evaluate probability probability values accurately using this new framework of genetic modeling. So if we can evaluate the probability values accurately, we can address the rest challenges on the left side. And moreover, those accurate probability values are very important for applications such as outlier detection, model comparison, or lossless compression. And finally, because we are aiming to build a more powerful framework of genetic models, we of course want to generate samples with better quality. So not only do we want to generate samples with better quality, we also want to control this generation process in a principled way so that we may use this genetic model for numerous downstream applications. And one example is medical image reconstruction, which I will discuss briefly later in the tutorial. So now in today's talk, I will show you one such framework that satisfies all three desiderata listed here. And the key of this framework is to work with score functions to represent our probability distribution. So what is the score function? Well, suppose we have a continuous probability distribution where we use Px to represent the probability density function. We define the score function as the gradient of log Px. So this quantity has multiple names. It can be called as the Stein score function to differentiate from Fisher score functions that typically appear in statistics. It can also be called as the score function or simply score. So be careful this gradient is taken with respect to the random variable x. It is not taken with respect to any model parameter like theta. So what does our score function look like? Let's consider a simple example, which is a mixture of two Gaussians. In this figure, I show the density function and the score function for this mixture of Gaussian distribution. The density function is color coded where a darker color indicates higher density. The score function is a vector field that gives the direction where the density function grows most quickly. So given the density function, we can compute the score function very easily because we can just take the derivative. Conversely, with the score function, we can also recover the density function in principle by computing integrals. So mathematically, this score function preserves all the information in the density function. So they are equivalent to a certain sense. But computationally, this score function is much easier to work with compared to the density function. So when we work with the score function for representing probability distributions, we get our score-based genetic models. And I will show you that this score-based genetic models has multiple advantages. So first, it allows very flexible models because the score functions actually do not need to be normalized at all, which means you can use very flexible neural network models, uh, neural network models to uh, represent this score function. And we can learn such models or score functions from data using principled statistical approaches. The second advantage is uh, we can directly generate samples from those models of score functions. And those samples could have surprisingly good quality and can be even better than girls in many situations. And moreover, we can control this sample generation process in a principled way for many important applications. And finally, even if we only have the model of the score function, we can still compute the probability values accurately. And empirically, we can even obtain better probability values compared to those models that directly work with probability density functions. So in the rest of the tutorial, I will first focus on how score-based generation. So as you can notice, you know, at from the uh, references for each of these categories, 
from 2019 through 2022, uh, including outstanding papers and whatnot. That's his PhD right there. So in the rest of the tutorial, I will first focus on how score-based genetic modeling allows very flexible models. So recordant one major difficulty in deep genetic modeling is due to the intractable normalizing constant problem when we are trying to model the probability density function. So indeed, if we want to model this probability distribution using a, a, a normalized probability model, then no matter how we change our model parameters or model architectures or other configurations, we always have to ensure that the distribution that represented is fully normalized. Or in other words, the area below this curve has to be one. And due to this constraint, due to this constraint, when we use the deep neural network to model those density functions, we always have to deal with this intractable normalizing constant uh, difficulty. But in contrast, if we model the same distribution through the score functions, then as the animation shows, there is no such normalization restriction. And in fact, if we compute the score function for the neural network on the left side, we notice that the score function is the difference of two terms. Only the second term involves the intractable normalizing constant. But the second term is always zero because the gradient of any constant is always zero. As a result, the score function equals the gradient of the deep neural network. And as you might know, those gradients of deep neural networks can be easily computed with automatic differentiation or with bank propagation. So this is a very efficient operation. And from now on, I will use the simple as theta to denote such a deep neural network model for the score function. And I will call it a score model. Suppose we have collected a large training data set. And again, we use x1, x2 to xn to denote each point in this data set. We assume the underlying data density is given by p data. With our knowledge in statistics, we know that we can train a problem properly normalize the statistical model to estimate the underlying data density using methods such as maximum likelihood. And because we want to work with the score functions, we want to develop a similar approach that can allow us to train a score model to estimate the underlying score function from a limited set of training data points. And we can formulate this problem as score estimation. So mathematically, we are given a bunch of data points, which are assumed to be ID sampled from the data distribution P data. And our goal is to estimate this score function of the data density. We are given a score model. This is, a, this is assumed to be a deep neural network model that maps a d-dimensional input to a d-dimensional output. And we hope to train this score model such that it approximates our ground truth score function of the data distribution. So how can we train this score model to be close to our ground truth data score function? Well, we need to minimize a certain objective. This objective has to compare two vector fields of score functions. Here, one vector field is the ground truth data score function. The other vector field is predicted by our score model. How can we compare their difference? Let's recall that those two vector fields actually lie in the same space. So we might be able to compute the difference vectors between those pairs of vectors from the original vector fields. And then we can average over the lenses of those difference vectors to form a single scalar valued objective. So mathematically, we can capture this intuition with the Fisher divergence objective. So Fisher divergence is essentially an unexpected squared Euclidean distance between the data score and the model score averaged over samples from the data distribution. However, Fisher divergence cannot be directly computed because we don't know the ground truth value of the data score function. But luckily, there is a way to address this challenge. And the method is called score matching. So score matching uses integration by parts or Gauss's theorem to convert Fisher divergence into the following equivalent objective. So the 
objective at the bottom is equivalent to Fisher divergence up to a constant. But since constants do not affect optimization, the score matching objective defines the same optimum as the Fisher divergence. So in the score matching objective, there is no dependency on the score function of the data distribution anymore. And moreover, the expectation in score matching can be efficiently approximated using the empirical mean over the training data set. So, so far so good. However, the I just wanted to pause here. So he's building the model for uh, evaluating or calculating the score around the data. And uh, what he is going to rely on is some finding from 2005, which we also saw last week, but didn't go into the details of this, uh, uh, that uh, since we don't have the actual data distribution, right? Uh, so, in, or, or the model for that, the probability model for that. So we end up relying on the uh, workaround here, which because it's uh, equivalent to this to a constant, as he said, I'm just repeating what he just said. Uh, so works out fine. And because we have a limited amount number of data points, so it's approximately equal to this. I'll continue unless people have any questions about it. Uh, I, I see a question on chat. So is S theta minus delta of this, does it automatically ensure B theta minus uh, B data? So is the score difference automatically bring the uh, optimize for the, the probability distribution objective? Yeah, uh, that's the question, so, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so, uh, it will do that. Uh, he will, through a lot of reasonings, when he goes eventually to measure the, uh, you know, there are several metrics to measure the performance, right? like inception score and FID and all that, right? So there you can see that uh, uh, the uh, images generated get a better score than the previous models, for sure. Uh, so in some sense, it is definitely, I mean, that's one of the objectives anyway, right? So eventually, the the foundation of uh foundation is the score model or the score uh, uh function. So if you are able to get the score function, then you can do the subsequent downstream tasks, including the uh probability distribution modeling, uh, also better. Because if you recall, one of one of the objectives when you were showing the picture of a dog and versus a cookie with some uh raisins on it. Uh, and that's where he was trying to come up with that. Well, not only are we able to do a good generation, but we are also able to do a good uh, 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 discriminatory uh, uh, evaluation based on the public distribution that we get there. Hopefully that answers Karthik. Yeah, Dave. I mean, I was just curious, like, uh, uh, does it, uh, I mean, is this a sufficient condition to ensure that uh, uh, the uh, resulting uh, 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 probability distribution that you get is closer to the data distribution or not? Looks like it is, but yeah, I was just uh, uh, probably looking for some intuitive uh, uh, reasoning for why that could be the case. So there are lots of proofs that, of course, in this presentation, he'll bypass, and one of those papers will have the proofs as well. Uh, towards the end, there is, I mean, there's so many papers that he talks about here, right? So mm -hmm. there is a chart also on uh, where he showcases the negative log like likelihood uh, uh, metric also much better for, for these score-based models. So which essentially tells us that we did a good job of, uh, you know, uh, estimating the probability distribution. But in fact, even in this presentation, since we are going to stay at the high level, we are not doing one paper, we are doing the overall theory, if you may. So we'll bypass many of the proofs, but there are pointers along the way to where you can go deeper and look into the proofs. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Dave, at a high level though, if you know the derivative of a function or the gradient of a multivariate function everywhere, then you can recover exactly that function. 
uh, right and i think you that. cut off somewhere but i think what you're saying is that if you know that then you can estimate the probability distribution uh except that when you do the integration there is a constant and that constant you don't know how much it could be so uh to no, large no, no, extent, no. Yes. i'm saying if you have an accurate model of the score function you can integrate it everywhere okay if you have it yes <laughs> i'm not talking about the actual score function i'm saying your model you know its value everywhere uh yes but uh, we are bypassing that normalizing constant factor here right so uh if you if you have it you can uh sorry Dave, because you took that I, I don't think you're you're following i'm not i'm not talking about how you actually estimate it i'm just saying assume you wave your magic wand you've done some technique and you now have an accurate score function i'm saying to to kartik that yes Having an accurate score function means you have an accurate probability distribution because uh, the either can be calculated from the other. Uh, Ted, I think the question I had in some sense was do finite errors in uh, uh, not being able to match uh, 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 as exactly do they result in finite errors in uh, uh, the p theta as well? I think that is where I was uh, going, and what you're suggesting is, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the error should be bounded. Yeah. So, 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 I was actually thinking. So I was going to say. So that's the first thing is that is if you have a super accurate, but then the next question is how stable is it? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, are these are these are these small you know numeric errors or whatever estimation errors? Your your data is not you know. Uh, infinite and perfectly mm -hmm. IID. Yeah. So empirically, this thing seems to be working, but I don't, I don't know, Dave, if he's going to go into more than that. Got it. He, he will not. The only thing that uh, I, I know what you're saying, Ted. Uh, I hear you. Uh, the only thing that I wanted to highlight was that score is actually a, a derivative of your log probability, right? So, uh, when you are going back from score to the to the actual probability, uh, then there is a constant because you now you'll do the inverse of derivative, which is an integral, and there will be a constant, and you don't know that constant. So I was just throwing in there. So yes, you can be very close, but there is some some uh, it's not there's some uh, dependency on that integral. I don't know if you follow what I'm saying, but. We can take that offline anyway, it's 7.53. So I'll continue here for a little more. Uh, let's at least finish the score model today, and then we can continue the noise condition score uh, model next. Let's continue here for now. That's it. So, so far so good. However, the score matching objective is not scalable to compute, especially when you want to use deep neural networks to model high dimensional data points. So let's suppose our score function is parameterized by a deep neural network, which we call deep score models. In order to use score matching, we have to compute two terms, where one term is the squared Euclidean norm of the uh, score, score model output. The second term is the choice of the Jacobian of the score model. So for the first term, it is super simple to compute and very efficient because we just need one forward propagation to get the output. Then we can compute the square of the L2 norm very efficiently. For the second term, things become a little bit more complicated because we need one, pro one forward propagation to compute the first element of the score function output. And we need a bank propagation to compute the first element on the diagonal of this Jacobian. So this procedure has to be repeated multiple times until we have recovered all diagonal elements on the Jacobian. And then we can sum over the diagonal elements to get the trace. So this whole procedure requires a lot of bank propagations. And uh, the number of bank propagations actually is uh, proportional to the dimensionality of our data point. For modeling high dimension data like images, we might need to deal with millions of dimensions. And this means score matching in its naive form is not scalable. So to address this challenge, 
we actually propose a more efficient variant of a score in which we term sliced score matching. The basic intuition is that one-dimensional problems should be much easier to solve than those high-dimensional problems. And how can we convert a high-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional problem? Well, we can leverage random projections. We project the high-dimensional vector fields to random directions, then we get one-dimensional scalar fields. So suppose those two high-dimensional vector fields are close to each other. Then we can project them along random one-dimensional directions. This gives us one-dimensional scalar fields. Those scalar fields will also be close to each other. So we can capture this intuition with the concept of a sliced Fisher divergence. Here V denotes the projection direction. It is a vector. And PV denotes the distribution of those projection uh, directions. So we compute the inner product to V and those two score functions and measure the resulting difference between them. And we can again leverage integration by parts to eliminate the dependency on the ground truth data score. This gives us the sliced score matching objective. And in sliced score matching, there is no trace of a Jacobian anymore. Instead, we have vector Jacobian vector product. And this term is much more scalable to compute. So this is actually not hard to see because we can rewrite the vector Jacobian vector product as an alternative form on the right hand side. So this just requires us to swap the location of V and A theta within the gradient operator. So now I will show you how to compute this vector Jacobian vector product very efficiently. First, we just need one forward propagation to get the output of S theta. And then we can directly compute the inner product between V and S theta. So this amounts to adding one additional neuron to the computational graph. And next, we can compute the gradient by doing one bank propagation. And as the last step, we just need to compute the inner product between V and the gradient. So the whole procedure only requires one bank propagation, which is much more efficient compared to the vanilla form of score matching. So this is how sliced score matching works in practice. We just sample a mini bunch of data points from our data set. And for each data point, we sample uh, one single projection direction from our distribution of PV. And then we form the empirical estimate of the sliced score matching uh, training objective using the empirical mean over our sample data points and those projection directions. So the projection distribution PV is typically a simple standard Gaussian distribution, or sometimes better, you can use random micro distributions, which are uniformly di distributed sine vectors. And then we can use stochastic gradient descent to minimize our empirical objective for sliced score matching. And if you want a better performance or equivalently lower variance of our training objective, you could potentially use more projections per data point. So that concludes the discussion of a slice of score mention. So oh, given that we are right at eight o'clock, I just thought that maybe we can use this as the cutoff point, even though it's in the middle of the second algorithm for score matching. Uh, unless people want to finish this, this will be another five, seven minutes. Yeah, I think this is a good stopping point. And then uh, kind of along the, the the question that Kardec asked before, right? So like, yeah, slice score matching is easier, but then the question is, does it converge too slowly compared to full score matching? And obviously he's gonna show the answer is no, it's not too slow. But that would be the obvious question of like, yeah, given infinite time, this thing will converge. But that doesn't mean that it's practical. Right. In fact, he will showcase, as you said, or, or rightly guessed, uh, that that is practical and uh, uh, it is actually better both in terms of efficiency and also very, very close to the best yeah. out there. So, Yeah, because I think about like reinforcement learning, there's there's things that like you can prove that like, oh, like Q learning or whatever, like will converge. But 
for high dimensional data, you can't do queue learning because you, you really do need infinite time for it to converge. And so we don't have infinite time. Right. Uh, so yeah, uh, hopefully it was, you know, when, when you find videos like these, you don't have to put much effort in explaining or going through things. So I mean, he did an amazing job of going through this. Uh, I, I love this video. Hopefully uh, you guys did too. Yeah, I'm going to stop the recording now.